Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. And as you note, uh, I've sort of lacked a bit in terms of uh, as far as the vets were concerned, because as you know, I'm, I'm constantly reaching out to vets to let them know that they should get out and and uh, I .e. access their benefits and this, that, and the other. So please, if you if you haven't gone down to the VA and gotten your card and whatever, please get out and do that. And for those families who who are living with vets, especially at this age, especially those who are in Viet we're in the Vietnam War aspect of it, there are many services that are at the vet at the VA that they should be have access to so please uh, get them out there get your card and it's very very important okay again thanks for serving okay well now let's go on with the show here all I'll say is this you know it's it's really tough out there right now politics is heavy we've got a presidential election we've got local elections we've got issues across the board all I can say to you is just be patient all I can say to you is make sure you vote make sure you register to vote and all I can say to you is to make sure you get the voter's guide. A lot of times that's probably the closest thing to, to basically trying to get a sense of what the issues are because there's, there's sort of an auditing thing within that whole that whole piece. And But be, be aware that um, when you're looking at ads and this, that, and the other in the various medium, if you will, that's probably the only time that um, uh, folks have the opportunity to, to say what they want to say, but it's not really checked. You know, you can. It's, a, it's my point. It's a bonanza side from the media standpoint because they make the money, and I'm not going to. I'm just being straight up with you. But you need to get the right answer. So, I would say that um, put the voters' pamphlet on the side of you. Get your ballot. As you know, we, you know, we we we've got we've got a mail-in kind of a ballot aspect of it. And take your time and get together with maybe family or friends and have some discussions. Or look at the Oregon Voter Digest like myself, and you'll get the opportunity to get a better feel of what. Being, is being presented before you. Okay, so take the time. So with that being said, I say I've got an issue here that um, we're going to discuss today uh, with a gentleman that I've known for a number of years here in, the, in Oregon, i.e. Portland, Oregon, i.e. Northeast Portland, or whatever. He's a mail carrier, and when you think about mail carriers, they pretty well know what they pretty well know what the sense of the community is all about throughout the country, for that matter. And so we're fortunate to have someone here with us that will talk about an issue that um, that hits right to the pocketbook. If you haven't retired yet, you, or you're in the process, you still have 10 or 15, 20 years to do it that way, and whether or not you're able to survive uh, in uh, in your in your respective communities, I mean, bread and butter issues, and that is, you know, you've got to, you got to eat, and you, you got to be able to get out there and, and do whatever's necessary to pick up a pick up a checkbook, okay? Anyway, we're talking about this $15 an hour deal. You've, you've probably heard about 15 bucks an hour, uh, basically raising the minimum wage sound, minimum wage from from one one point to the other. In this particular area, we, we're going around to 15. That's all over the country, for that matter. And so, uh, I thought, for, even for my benefit, you know, I, it's one thing about being a host on a show like this. I have the opportunity to get a better feel of. Uh, of, of various issues, and so I can call someone in, and they can kind of explain it. Well, I got a guy here today, <clears throat> who was one of the uh, one of the uh, individuals that was part and partial of bringing this fifteen dollars uh, uh, raise the fifteen minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, uh, the ballot initiative. And I guess there were three people around the deal, but but anyway, without that, I think I'm done now. I'm just going to introduce this guy. How about how about how's it going, Jamie? I'm all right. How are you? Bruce? It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. <laughs> thank like you a, for inviting me on the show. Well, hey, thank you for being here. He's he's a very busy person, so we're going to get right down to it. Uh, let's let's start off by uh, educating folks about the fifteen dollars an hour deal from the mm -hmm. standpoint. First off, where did it you know? its origin, if you will. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. okay? Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. How did it start? Well, it really people? got started, this Fight for 15, as they call it, the movement. Uh, in New York City, fast food workers went on strike mm -hmm. uh, three years ago. And uh, they were, you know, back then, uh, were the idea of Fight, uh, fight for 15 in a union uh, was it was a dream, you know. Mm -hmm. People thought, 15? Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. uh, the federal minimum wage 7.25, right? The minimum wage in Oregon now is 9.25, and but this movement spread across the country so that uh, I mean there were there were these uh, series of, of strikes by fast food workers in particular, but other low wage workers, and uh, e even uh, as as recently as November there was a there was a, a day of action where there was strikes in 
250 cities and mm -hmm. six, 60,000 workers, uh, mostly fast food workers, but mm -hmm. low wage workers. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then some victories started to happen. Seattle passed a, a $15 minimum wage. San Francisco, Los Angeles, mm. now back to New York, the whole state of New York, they've raised, uh, they're on a path to 15 for fast food workers. Mm -hmm. and then in Oregon, people uh, started, they started making some changes. The home care workers for the state of Oregon now have a path for a 15, to a $15 minimum mm -hmm. wage. The city of Portland, the Multnomah County, um, Metro, uh, city of Milwaukee, they all voted to, uh, raise the wages for the workers, you know, the government workers, mm -hmm. up to a, a path to 15. So it's it's been it's um, it's not just a, a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a number that has kind of caught the imagin imagination of low wage workers, mm -hmm. but it's also it's also a number that uh, actually brings workers out of poverty. In, mm -hmm. in Oregon, the the studies show that uh, even for a single individual, all across mm -hmm. the state of Oregon. They, you need 15 to get to be self-sufficient. That is okay. To, okay. to to be able to you know pay your rent and pay your utilities mm -hmm. and your medical mm -hmm. bills and your mm -hmm. child care and uh, be able to to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. um, there there are a number of studies. The the University of Washington had a, a, a self-sufficiency study. The, there's a, a group called the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Mm -hmm. There's another one, another study by the Alliance for a Just Society, and they all show that. For people to be able to get off of government programs like food stamps or Section 8 housing or child care or subsidies or, you know, the Oregon Health Plan, mm -hmm. that they, they need 15. And actually in Portland, it's even higher. I mean, if, if you look at the the federal standard for um, what what a person should pay for housing, 30 percent of their income, mm -hmm. uh, the average rent for a one bedroom apartment in this town is like 1100 to 1500 well, dollars and you're really talking you need and you're going to need 18 19 dollars yeah. an hour yeah. full time yeah. to be able yeah. to pay that yeah yeah that's where the number 15 comes number from 15. was business involved during that particular time in terms of those discussions coming up with those numbers you know what i'm saying there's always the employer the employee kind of thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's actually come from the workers. You okay, know, all right, you know, okay. Um, what ha what's happening right now in Salem, you know, is there's negotiations going on right. uh, between uh, representatives of workers and, and the business sector. And mm -hmm. uh, we know that the, that the governor has come up with a proposal. Right. First, it was to, uh, to raise the wage to 1550 in the Portland area. Now it's to raise the wage to 1450. But, you know, who knows? You know, mm -hmm. it's just a negotiation. Yeah, right, 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 right. right, right. Yeah, okay, you know. good. Okay, we did that. I, I might be a little bit redundant, but I've got some questions here. I'm just mm -hmm. going to just throw them out to you and just let you do talk yeah, about yeah. it. Okay, who would be impacted by a minimum uh, wage raise? We talked a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if, we're, if we're raising up to 15, and uh, we have a ballot initiative. We're collecting signatures on a ballot mm -hmm. initiative. Right now we have about uh, close to 40,000 signatures. We need 88,000 to get it on the ballot in November. Uh, we're phasing it, phasing it in uh, over three years um, to make it easier on the businesses. But 40 percent of Oregon workers would be uh, make less than 15 now. Mm -hmm. uh, so there'd be a huge number of workers that would be been impacted, about 700,000 workers. And it would particularly um, uh, impact the black community and, okay. and Latino communities okay. uh, because 50 percent of black workers make less than 50, uh, 15 and 60 percent of Latino workers make okay. less than 15. So it would have a, a, a disproportionately positive impact mm -hmm. on communities of color. Okay, why not focus on getting an education to get a job with better wages? I mean, I, I'm just well, that's a common, that is a common question, you know, like, well, isn't this supposed to be a training wage or just mm -hmm. a starting wage and mm -hmm. people get an education and get that's the pathway to a better job? Mm -hmm. And that may have been that may have been true one time. And you, people think about the minimum wage as something that's paid to teenagers. But currently, 80 percent of low wage workers are adults. You know, um, the average age is 35. Uh, so these are people that have. You know, we've been, in the, been in, the, in the workforce for a while, mm -hmm. um, and 33% of them have some college. Uh, this is much more than used to be true of minimum wage workers, that that folks are, are actually um, getting some college education or even graduating from college mm -hmm. and, and, and ending up in these low-wage jobs because... Most of the jobs that are being created these days are low-wage jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's been especially true since the economic downturn of um, you know ten years ago. 
or whenever eight years ago mm -hmm. um, that the new that the new jobs are so that so the getting an education doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get a good a, a good paying a good paying job and it still is an issue the issue of education is an issue within within the community anyway well of course yeah it's major and and um, not getting the adequate you know what I'm saying right yeah get 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 even uh, graduating from Graduating from high school doesn't necessarily mean that you should have a good no, education. No, even, even but in it's college. also true that the, the new jobs that are being created uh, don't require a college education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about the impact of well, the big issue now? Is it, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we spend a little bit more. We'll, spend, we'll probably go back to this other point. But, but this other, the main thing that really hits the table is the small business person. Mm -hmm. What about the impact uh, on small businesses? Spend well, this some time. Is, let's spend some time on that. This is an issue that uh, that um, has come up at the at the legislature quite a bit. They, uh, small business people have a lot of influence in the in the legislative process, and and um, most businesses, um, you know, close to ninety percent, more than ninety percent, uh, have less than ten employees. You know, there's a lot of businesses that have that are small. But most workers work for large businesses. Um, mm -hmm. half, or, half of the workforce works for businesses that have over 100. Right. Um, you know, only 7% only of workers are, are actually employed in businesses that have less than, less than five employees, for example. Um, but even those small businesses will benefit from a raised, wage, raised minimum wage because Workers will stick around longer. You know, there won't be this high turnover of people looking for something better. Uh, the the costs that you end up uh, having to spend on recruiting and training workers, plus the the uh, increased productivity for people to stick around that they're happier with their job, mean lower cost for the small business, and of course workers that are around longer. You know, mm -hmm. and they're happier with their job, mm -hmm. provide better service to the customers. And then the other aspect is that. The customers of these small businesses uh, will have more money in their pocket to spend, and you'll have more customers coming in. Like, for example, the the restaurant, you know, where people, you know, a low wage worker has makes more money, and, and what do they do? They come out and eat, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, what we're finding in places like um, Seattle, where the wage is going up, or other places where the minimum wage is being increased, is that there's actually more people going into business. Fewer businesses are failing, and there are more more jobs being created. Um, so, it's it is true that there's a high turnover in small businesses. I some number like 50 percent of small businesses go under in you know within yeah. five years. Right. Well, that's, that's but that's the, mostly that's not so much because of wages, but because of competition and you know the larger businesses. Uh, beating out the smaller businesses in, in having, uh, you know, economies of scale and like that. And we do have a whole, a, quite a few small businesses that support this campaign to raise the minimum wage to 15. There's one, there's an, um, a group called the Main Street Alliance, which is a, a, a group of, um, uh, I can't remember how many, um, Hundreds, it, it, hundreds locally, or thousands. Well, or they're local? they're locally, but they're also national. Okay, okay. Um, and I should I should know exactly yeah, how many yeah, there are, but there are yeah. quite a few small businesses, and um, we also have we also have uh, economists local. We have a, well nationally we have about two hundred economists, but locally we have about uh, ten economists that are. Uh, supporting our campaign and basically putting for, forward this argument mm -hmm. that, that it would actually benefit small businesses overall. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, just a little, I, I'm in small, I'm in business to a certain degree. Right. And um, very familiar with the, the startup. You know, normally the startup for small business, you got to scratch any, get, get as much as, well, you got to generate some funds. You got to either borrow it, if you will, yeah. or you try to borrow it from other entities or whatever. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, it takes a five, if not more, now, if in fact you're interested in getting small business, because the competition with big business right. is such that that you've got to stick around a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the idea is, it's kind of like on a mom and pa. A lot of times, there's always family involved in the deal, that kind of a deal. And um, and and a lot of the costs sometimes you once you borrow the money. You got you got a bill to pay, right? Mm -hmm, right. And then you you got sometimes you got these hidden costs. A lot of times you don't know about, if you will. 
and it's really a tough situation. Um, whether or not the the, the businesses, uh, let me let me go back away. The, de- the 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 other thing is the definition of small business. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people think about well, a two person business is is kind of equivalent to a person that's uh, in business that that has about twenty people employed. They, they they're also at times being classified as small businesses. Mm-hmm. That's another interesting piece. So the startup guy, the startup person, uh, normally they'll, they'll stay with themselves, normally the investors, the on par kind of a deal. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm still struggling. You know, like you said, you're struggling against the big business, which next door you to you, and then yourself at the same time. Somebody gets sick on the job, uh, you, know, you get sick on the job, you got a two person deal, all of a sudden you're by yourself. So mm-hmm. what do you do with that piece? Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're closing and you got the hours. Well, anyway, the long, the long and short of the deal is it's really, it's, it, there's a big question mark as to whether or not the Ma and Pa shop could actually make it in the arena. I'm just, I'm just giving some discussions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like considerations. Of, have, there any, have there been consideration from the standpoint of saying, well, we'll, we'll look at this, this business maybe in a position to afford 15 bucks an hour. But this smaller business, the startup, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, may, may not be able to afford it at that point in time. But they still may need some help. Mm-hmm. Well, in, yeah. in Seattle, they, they set up a staggered phase-in. Oh, they did? Where the, uh, where the larger businesses had to pay the higher wages sooner. Mm-hmm. And then the smaller business had a longer phase-in. Okay. Uh, that's not happening in Oregon. That isn't the way that, that, oh, the, that oh, the piece so I, was crafted. I, I, All the businesses uh, face a three-year phase-in. Okay. The same. Whether so it's all fifteen or, bucks an hour. Yeah, or large Straight or small, up. right? Um, any and, feedback? Any feedback from the standpoint? Any objections? I guess you. Well, the there's also the the governor's pr- plan, uh, which we don't agree with, but it it, it came up with uh, in these negotiations with businesses. Okay. To fa- to have a um, higher wage in the Portland metro area than the rest of the state, so they have a they have a um, a six year phase in. To 1450. This is her proposal uh, for the Portland metro area, okay. and then a, um, a six-year phase into 1325 for the rest of the state. So I don't know how they come up with that, but apparently they think that uh, that workers need less to live mm-hmm, on, mm-hmm. or the businesses uh, can't absorb the costs as easily mm-hmm, in other parts mm-hmm, of the state. Mm-hmm. But you know, our our attitude is that all workers. They work full time to live, deserve to be out of poverty. They deserve mm-hmm. a living wage, mm-hmm. and um, you know, as 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 our past president Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, if a business can't pay a living wage, maybe they shouldn't be in business. Mm. Mm. But you know, the, the lifeblood of the <laughs> the lifeblood of this country is based on small business, though. Well, we, we still have that there enthusiasm. Are, most of the businesses are small. Yeah. But most of the workers work for large businesses, so it, you know, it depends on what you mean by lifeblood, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess my point is that for, in Oregon, for instance, you think about when you're in the Portland metropolitan area, it's a little different than the mm-hmm. rural areas, mm-hmm. and they're having more struggles too. Oh, yeah. Open up, a, open up a small business in a rural area. Uh, you know, at one point in time, you, we had all kinds of wages coming out of the. Uh, uh, we, you know, we were forest trees sure. type deal. Right. But guess what? We don't have any forest trees, and people still have to eat. And people are still trying to figure out where do I go to the store to eat, or a little mm-hmm. restaurant sometime, whatever. And they're really struggling so for a person to get in the business that way. Mm-hmm. That's a heavy. You got me right. Right, sure. To a certain degree. Yeah, and so, then, but you, who who's putting these small businesses out of business? You know, like the mom and pop stores getting put out of business by Walmart. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not the it's not the wages; it's the WalMarts that are putting people out of business. Well, it takes a lot of enthusiasm just to go in business to begin with. You well, know, I mean, that's kind of the lifeblood of this country to a certain degree. Everybody wants to be in business for themselves, yeah. but a lot of times people don't realize what it takes to get in business. And you know you could lose uh, you could lose all your savings and this that right. and other, you know what I'm saying. Right. So so looking at that bottom line really doesn't hit you hard until all of a sudden you know you hit some other thing whether it be taxes or mm-hmm. whether it be this or start up this or, or something happens you can't you got to I mean the, just the cost of going into business is heavy stuff, and then if all of a sudden you you can't borrow any more money to keep you going. Mm-hmm. You know that's another different situation. So anyway, that, that, that's a that's uh, interesting. Our, you know, our, our concern coming you. from the from the workers' point of view is, you know, 
workers are taking a risk every day trying to go to work and make a you know yeah. make a living they lose their homes because but, they but can't I, afford to pay but, the rent but i gotta pay or they can't afford to pay <laughs> but i gotta mortgage. come up with the money because right. don't do as big as and a small you go out business of business place. and then you yeah. have to go to work yeah, as a, yeah, like yeah, the rest it, of us exactly exactly <laughs> because the thing is is that you, you know normally a business you have to pay your you have to pay the employee first you got mm -hmm. me before mm -hmm. you pay yourself and that's why they talk about this five years or sometimes seven sure. years or whatever yeah. because at the end of the day they're not getting paid a dime uh, until after that cycle goes because they got to pay up pay up the bills to start up the whole startup and whatever mm. and um, so anyway it, it, it's kind of interesting uh, about the um, uh, about this discussion that's why we're having this discussion now because I think the Ma and Pa piece is pretty heavy when I think about Portland a lot of folks are for instance with the, oh, another one another problem that we have here in the Portland metro area we got a lot of carts Oh yeah, we got a lot of carts, in there. Mm -hmm. and the reason why we have a lot of carts is that a lot of folks can't pay for the rent, right? To be able to go in business that way, you got my yeah. point. But then, the people in the cart business are kind of being more competitive with the people in the brick and mortar. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, and you got the big business there too, and all. Mm -hmm. So they're really having a tough time, if you will, trying to stay in the business aspect of it. And even the big businesses, certainly, depending. And we, we we're talking about. Restaurants that are kind of like on the same Walmart kind of a deal, you know. What I mean, they're closing, mm -hmm. closing all even the little small, the small stores, if you will. You know, the one you can just walk to right from home. You know, right yeah. on the corner. Well, of the street. Starbucks is putting the small coffee shops out of business. Yeah, for yeah. example. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a good example of the yeah. piece. And you know, you want people to get out there and get in business. You know what I mean? It it makes it good for everybody around the tape. But the idea is affordability. Mm -hmm. Then the idea is get a job. And when I think mm -hmm. about the unemployment piece within our own city, it's pretty high. Well, it is. It is. It, uh, yeah. And, it's pretty really high. And so what do we do with that? How do we do that piece? Well, <laughs> um, w w what we're finding is in places where the minimum wage is being raised is that there are actually more businesses being created. Uh, for example, in San Jose, where mm -hmm. in, 19, in 2013 they raised the minimum wage by $2 in mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. and 4,000 businesses were created. Mm -hmm. uh, there's... there's, there's uh, no, I'm sorry. Four thousand jobs were created. That sounds better. And but that, that more more people went into business, fewer businesses failed, mm -hmm. because more more low wage workers had money in their pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm on the when I'm out petitioning, but you know, trying to get yeah. signatures for yeah. our ballot right. initiative, the the main question I get is not about small businesses, right. but about prices. People are worried that uh, that the increase in wages is mean an automatic increase in prices, and. My me, most immediate response is the prices are going up anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, wages haven't kept up. Uh, you look at this town, the rents in this town have gone up oh, yeah, 15 well, that, that, just in the last oh, year. That's, that's wages have been stagnant. Yeah, but then on the other easy, hand, yeah. you know, gasoline prices are going down, but yeah. wages aren't going down. So yeah. prices, prices are somewhat connected to mm -hmm. wages, but mm -hmm. the prices are more connected to supply and demand mm -hmm. and competition. Uh, and wages is just a piece of, mm -hmm. you know, the cost. The well, costs yeah. are rent. Utilities, mm -hmm. supply, you know, mm -hmm. raw materials, well, you, you make utilities, good, all that. You make a good point about the employee aspect of it because you notice that here just recently, some of the businesses uh, in the restaurant business are including the tips in the check. Oh, uh huh. You see what I mean? Sure. And that's how they are responding, if you will, to the making sure that the folks are sat, they're, they're trying to satisfy the, mm -hmm. the, the idea that the wages are going to have to go up, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And so they're looking at, well, it, are my customers going to be still coming in? See, you see what I'm saying? Because yeah. a lot of times, times are tough sometimes, so folks can't even leave a tip. As mm -hmm. opposed to a buck or whatever, they're just going to put, what's the, what's the, what's the number, 10, 15%? 10, 15%. 10, 15 yeah. Yeah. So you do the 15%, so gee, I, I don't have a buck. You know what I mean? All of a sudden now, I'm told that it's going to cost me another 15 percent more just for the food. Mm -hmm. So, so what do I do? See what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden, they, they all get driven maybe over to, to uh, McDonald's or Burger King or this, that, and the other. They say, "Well, gee whiz, I shouldn't be eating that food anyway because then I got obesity." <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? But, well, but you know, but discussion. Other, it's you, interesting this whole question of tips because, in other countries, yeah, like um, in Europe or whatever, uh, where the wages are higher, tips are not. They're not customary. People don't give tips because, the you know, the workers don't have to rely on individual customers having a, the correct response to yeah, their service. Yeah, yeah, Everybody, yeah. all workers get 
the same and they get a little and they get a higher wage you know like uh, fast food workers in Denmark they get paid twenty two dollars an hour you know mm -hmm. and but the price of the food is not is not higher and how did they do that well I guess it I guess they they have a different Business yeah, model, yeah, different cow or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, but that, that's a that's another issue. It's going to be interesting to see what happens to businesses because we're just getting into this piece mm -hmm, right now, mm -hmm. and they're reacting this piece. But mm -hmm. then I, I I think what I see here in the Portland metropolitan area is going to drive a lot of folks to the carts. The well, competition is going to be a little bit more. You know if the prices if the prices go up significantly, but what we found is that they don't. That they don't go up significantly, right? and that you know, if, well, look for example at uh, you know the Oregon minimum wage currently is nine twenty five. The the Idaho minimum wage is seven twenty five. Okay. But the price of a hamburger is the same in, on both sides of the border. So what mm -hmm. that means is that in Idaho, the the owner is taking in more mm -hmm. profit mm -hmm. than in mm -hmm. Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but but because of competition, right. they keep the prices the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, we're going to have a special session, right, naturally, in the state uh, here we in are. Oregon. Yeah. And is this going to be discussed during that particular time, or are you going to be bringing this stuff up? Yeah, it starts tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and, and it's only a, a month long. Right. Um, and so how most time are they going? How much time are you going to have to yeah. put this piece well, they got the a, there's a, there's a hear, hearing on uh, Tuesday, and uh, they'll be voting out of in a committee. They'll be voting out on Thursday, probably. Uh, they're they're considering several different proposals, and mm -hmm. who knows, you know, what uh, what what's going to come out mm -hmm. but we're at the last session that is in 2015 okay. uh we we had uh 15 sponsors on our our 15 dollar minimum wage okay. ballot and uh, i mean um, bill and uh it didn't go anywhere there mm -hmm. was no no action at all on the minimum wage in the last session and it's the same legislators there now so even though the, the governor has brought forward her, her proposal we don't really expect that the legislature is going to move on this. Yeah. Uh, that's why we're collecting signatures for a ballot mm -hmm. initiative. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, our initiative to go to the ballot for mm -hmm. the people to vote mm -hmm. is putting pressure on them to do something because mm -hmm. they want to. They want to undercut us. They, their, um, the legislature believes that they have more wisdom than the people, and mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. you know the people will favor. Mm -hmm. a, you know all the polls. Three three different polls have shown that a majority of well, Oregonians support. Are you going to have any help on them? I think about when you when you, we talk about blacks and, and Hispanics and low low income folks. Mm -hmm. What about the um, the representatives from those areas? Let's take for instance in, in Northeast Portland. Mm -hmm. You've got Lou Frederick, yeah. who's a state representative. You've mm -hmm. got Chip Shields. Mm -hmm. Understand he's getting ready getting ready to cut whatever. And you got those two individuals. Yeah. Are high involved are they in this issue? Do they support well, the? Yeah, support they were. This? They were sponsors of the of the fifteen dollar bill were in, the, in the last session. Yeah. Okay. Any yeah, feedback from them? Them. Are they going to bring this thing at the table? Talk about this thing. Well, uh, pretty much what the, the the Democratic Party leadership is 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 doing right now is falling in behind the governor and mm -hmm. supporting that at her particular bill, which is. It's certainly an improvement over the current situation, mm -hmm. but it doesn't it doesn't reach 15. It doesn't allow uh, Portland to go higher, for example, because people in Portland need more. Uh, we're, we're trying to get a not only a statewide mm -hmm. 15, but the uh, ability of cities or counties to, to raise their own minimum wages. Mm -hmm. Currently, there's no local control uh, that is like Seattle did or San Francisco did, Portland can't do that. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a state preemption prohibiting cities and counties mm -hmm. from raising their own wages. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, uh, we're trying to get that changed okay. as well. Okay. The governor doesn't support that at this point. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, what about our mayor? Well, our yeah, mayor, uh, actually, the, the city of Portland had uh, uh, elected officials, both in the county, city, and metro levels, all have all said that they support the $15 Loretta, minimum Loretta wage. Loretta Smith's part of the deal? Who? Loretta Smith from the county, Morgan yes. County? And also and, and um, to lift that, lift the, pre, lift the preemption, yeah, to be able to allow or the city or the county to raise the wage higher because it actually is needed in in the Portland area. You know, <laughs> another interesting thing that comes off right off the bat is that I noticed that the city of Portland, I guess, they, they raised the, 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 the wages to 15 bucks an hour, right? Yep. For the reason. city workers. For the city workers. Yes. But then I'm thinking about the like poor folks like me. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out that since I'm paying the bill, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the bill payer aspect that, of that's it. That's your business. Uh, you know, I, I thought maybe it would have been a, it had been a better deal to maybe look at uh, raising the rates of the folks who are not in government first mm -hmm. before trying to raise it 
to raise it up for a person in government because a lot of times they got a lot of perks mm -hmm. that, that, that mm -hmm. the person out here is just working. You know what I'm saying? Sure. 15 bucks outside in the private sector and 15 bucks in government's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. 15 bucks on the, the government side, you're making about 20 bucks an hour. On the, on the other side, after you get through taking all the other goodies, you may be making about maybe 13, 14 bucks an hour. I'm just I'm just doing something out to you. Yeah. Well, one of the things about about raising the wage uh, in the private sector is that there there less less uh, money has to be spent on you know these these safety net programs you know like food stamps or Section 8 housing or the Oregon Health Plan. The taxpayer in Oregon would save 1.7 billion dollars from not having to pay out to those uh, to those safety net programs. Plus. The higher the low wage worker who's making 15 is going to be paying more in taxes. So right. it's actually going to be more support for government programs like education or whatever available uh, if we raise the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. We well, you don't know, look like that's going to be. We we'll, we'll need more discussion. But the idea was that I mm -hmm. wanted to get you on initially. Well, thank you very and much. And hopefully you'll come back. Could I, could I tell you... people how to how to get in touch with us? Yeah, please. I'm sorry. Go on. Go on. Right, right well, on. So, so I'm going to be in touch with you. You're going to come back. So we're uh, our website is <laughs> Oregonians for 15. Okay. Dot o r g Oregonians for 15. Dot org. That's okay. all one word. Okay. And you can find out about our ballot me measure and read read more about the different arguments okay. and see the news articles and like okay. that. Okay, okay. Well, let's put it this way. We'll have enough time, if you will, to, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. I would like for you to come back, let this session sort of you know, Yeah, maybe through, after you know. the session, maybe after would the legislative yeah, session, come back? we have to yeah. reevaluate yeah, what's because, going on. You know, I, I'm trying to catch up, too. Well, I mean, you've got all of the knowledge aspect of it. And, and that we're trying to communicate and educate the public out there so you'll know exactly where we are. Because, you know, because I'm sure, I know, I know, knowing you like I've known you, you're very interested in trying to get some feedback. You want to know what's going on because you want to make this thing is right, right we for everybody know. for that matter. We want to Very know. important. So hopefully you'll come back and uh, go make, get the session, get the news, and then and then come back and just educate us. All right. And then I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the postal workers because you got an sure. issue there too. But Do uh, we, we're at 4:30 right now. We're going to go on and get the. But we'll, you will be back. Yes, sir. Sounds great. Yes. Sir. Okay, folks, we're going to we're going to get Jamie to come back here. Uh, it might be a little confusing and whatever, but in all due respect, I'm learning too. That's what it's all about. Jamie's learning a little bit more, right, Jamie? Thank you, Bruce. Okay, good. Hey, thank you very much. We'll, we'll, we'll take care with you. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Welcome back, folks. Again, I'm Bruce Broussard, your host here at the Oregon Voters Digest. You might not know that's uh, for the first half hour. I mean, we were getting in the discussion that, in all due respect, as you can see, uh, there was a lot of questions I would like to have asked and gotten some answers, but in all due respect, just didn't have enough time and didn't have enough time to really pick up the deals. But I think uh, with uh, with uh, with Scott, well, not with Scott, but, but Jamie, he's going to be back. Uh, he's going to have a short session. And then hopefully they'll have some discussions about this 15 bucks an hour because it's going to have its impact on both sides of the aisle, both from the employer standpoint and from the employee standpoint. And, uh, you know, it, it's some pretty heavy stuff that we had. But we'll have enough time, if you will, before the election, before the election, and because it's all back up in May. We're going to have a whole, we're going to, it's going to, the plate is full. It, it, in fact, everything is spilling on the side about various issues and whatever. So what we're going to do this time around, we've got somebody here with us. You've seen him before. Uh, we've got Scott Jerkson here with us. I mean, he is our guru. He's going he's gonna to bring us all up to date 
about what's to expect, if you will, in this special session we get ready to have. He's going to kind of give us a feel for the impact of, uh, of various issues at the state level because all of our elected representatives are in the Salem area aspect of it. And um, But the bottom line is that all kinds of things happen during that particular time. So we're fortunate to have Scott here, and hopefully he's going to be one of the staples here that we're going to have here on the Oregon Voters Digest. Kind of, because there's, sometimes there's a disconnect between what happens locally and then what happens in Salem. We may have representation, if you will, in Salem, but a lot of times these people never come back enough, fast enough to educate us. They're busy trying to, quote, bring the bacon home, if you will. So so with Scott, uh, that's basically what that's the role he's going to play with. Every so often he's going to come back here and kind of give us a better feel of uh, some of the issues that we are more interested in and, and the impact of other issues around the state and how it impacts, if you will, your issues right here in the local, depending upon where you live let's say, in the state of Oregon, okay? That's what it's all about. Scott, how are you doing? Well, good. I, you know, we spent all of last week getting ready for the upcoming legislative right, session. Right. And as a result, I start waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning on my own, <laughs> my brain going wild and saying, okay, you, you have a lot of things to do. So that's uh, the us veteran staffers who have been yes. around for a while were there last week getting ready, and I imagine that come Monday, there's going to be a lot of people who weren't there last week who are going to wish that they were. Right, 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 right. I might add, too, that uh, Scott and I were at a forum yesterday, and I have a very interesting forum. It was actually it was on the R side, Republican side. And we well, had, it, was, yeah. it was nonpartisan. It, it was nonpartisan. No, but I'm thinking about your particular piece. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm making a point here. It, the fact of the matter is, that, but the point of the matter is that Scott was, was one of the presenters and whatever, from a media standpoint, it was a very interesting discussion that we were having. And, uh, and that's the other benefit that we have with Scott. He has to be a nonpartisan. He, he's got to understand both sides of the issues in order to be able to respond to whomever he's representing or whatever. So that I want to thank you for that. That was a, that was a very good conference. Uh, Richard did a good job in putting that piece together, and uh, and it's a nonpartisan. That was a nonpartisan piece to begin with, but he focused on that particular crowd. I hope that he can maybe put together another piece, maybe made up of these, for that matter, on the on that other side, or independence or whatever. But I thought it was a very interesting one, and I want to take my hat off to you and, and also Richard for putting that that particular piece on. Okay. Yeah, I think they usually have another conference right around May. Yeah, uh, yeah. Their youth conferences take place in May, and that usually coincides with my birthday. And Is that right? <laughs> these other ones that coincide well, with go, my man. wife's I'll, birthday. Well, I'm so. looking forward to that. Okay, hey, I'm just going to let you go now. Why don't we just go on and just start talking? But let's let's maybe start off in the um, let's say, let's talk about the legislature. Bring us up to date. What's up? Well, voters approved these regular sessions back in the November 2010 general election and it was a matter that the legislature referred to voters. The promise was that, well, we'll do annual sessions in even numbered years, we'll keep them you know, short, so they're just over a month, and we'll just use it to make adjustments to the budget and technical fixes. But what we're seeing instead is a lot of, because it's an election year, there's a lot of politics that gets played in them, mm -hmm. and a lot of gotcha, so to speak, where it's a matter of getting folks to vote against this bill so that you can use it in a hit piece in a campaign you're going to see a lot of that mm -hmm. uh, and you're also going to see a lot of major policy decisions hmm. uh, that folks will have to decide on the big theme of this session is that you have issues like the minimum wage mm -hmm. that will either be decided in the legislative session by the legislators or they'll carry through to the november general election and they will be voted on by voters at the ballot box okay Okay. Yeah, it tells them, uh, going back to that point, it, it, no, there's supposed to be a part-time legislature, right? We, we got this short span of time. This is not a full-time legislature, I mean, meaning the people not there, I mean, throughout the year, right? That's, that's, that's the process we have right now. Is it working, Scott? What do you think? Is They're it moving it towards, in the, the annual sessions was part of that, kind of a professionalization of the legislature, yeah. because... You ideally you want to have three co-equal branches of government, mm -hmm. but what happened is the way the legislature was before, and I was there ten years ago mm -hmm. you know, working for Representative Richardson, is that the legislature meets for five months every two years yeah. the way it was, and then that was it. And meanwhile, you've got the courts and the judiciary still going uh, three hundred days a year, mm -hmm. three hundred sixty-five days mm -hmm. a year, and then you'd still have the executive branch clicking away, and so. It's really difficult for part-time citizen legislatures to exercise the kind of oversight that you would want them to over these agencies if they 
come to town you know, they come yeah. to Salem for yeah. just under half a year every two years so what they do now is they keep the committees intact so even after this session ends you'll still have committee days every couple of months and it's also better for talent retention I think because you know those of us you want professional staff to be able to stay on top of this stuff mm -hmm. too except uh, it, it's pretty few and far between. I mean, 04, I was able to get a campaign job and then move over and, and, and do a session. Mm -hmm. But then the twenty the 2005 session ends, and you go, well, well, well now yeah. what? <laughs> I mean, back then I was young and single, so I, was like, yeah. I guess I'll just go move back in with my parents. Yeah, but, right, 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 right. You know, <laughs> so it is moving towards a kind of more professional. But the short session, the downside of it is that it is so short. And if you were too limited in scope to making adjustments, you could do it. Uh, but instead, the unintended consequence, I think, is that it limits public participation because you have shorter notice for the, the hearings and the bills that are coming mm -hmm. up in committee. Mm -hmm. And it also puts folks at a disadvantage who are outside of Salem. Mm -hmm. If you if you're down in Medford, if you're in the rural parts of the state uh, and someone says, OK, well, this bill is going to be heard in committee an hour from now. Mm -hmm. There's no physical way that you're mm -hmm. going to be able to get to Salem. Mm -hmm. And it advantages the insiders the lobbyists the people that are yeah. already in salem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you know uh, again I'm, I'm i'm kind of veering off a little bit but i'm asking because you, you you've been there you, you've had the opportunity to go through these, these these situations but what came up out of that piece was the term limit aspect of it because a lot of times people are concerned about term limit but then as to, but on the other hand since we don't have term limits well we have it in certain ways you know, but the bottom line is that the more mature the person becomes the more they're able to, if you will, talk to the issues, if you will. Let's talk to me about that. Oregon has had term limits before okay. in the legislature. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Talk to me. Legislators aren't actually paid that much. The okay. legislative salary is very low. In fact, I mean, it pointed out the irony of people lobbying legislators for $15 an hour minimum wage, when right. $15 an hour is way more than the legislators make. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> um, so that's that's all just part of the process right, you know, right, right, as right, it moves right, right. forward. But it's pretty difficult right now to recruit people to run mm -hmm. for these seats because mm -hmm. you have to give up a lot. Mm -hmm. And a lot. it's hard for people my age. I'm 35. Mm -hmm. If you're younger and you're married with kids, you either have to be independently wealthy or own your own business, be retired, or have a, an employer who's extremely understanding and says, oh, sure, we, we won't need you for yeah. six months every two years. Just mm -hmm. go ahead and, and take that off, and your job will be waiting for you mm -hmm. when you get back. So that's part of it. But there's also the institutional knowledge end of it, too. Because what happens is that, as it is, about a third of the House members this time around are completely different than they were from the, the previous, uh, from 2013 mm -hmm. session. Uh, because 2014, a lot of people didn't run for re-election. And so you create a situation where a lot of the institutional memory then goes to the agencies mm -hmm. and the lobby right, right. instead of your elected representatives. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think there's a danger in that. Um, federally, I mean, it, it's quite different. And you hear about this all the time where people say, oh, Congress has a 2% approval rating. It says, well, right, but 98% of those guys are going to get reelected in landslides. <laughs> No, it, it always thought members of Congress should probably make the median income in their districts mm -hmm. or something else instead of $100,000 yeah, a year right, right, beyond right, what the average guy right, in your right, district right, is right. making. So, right. I mean, maybe it's different federally, but in the House of Representatives, both statewide and federally, they're up every two years. They're yeah. up for re-election. Wow. So, wow. Um, in a way, you already have term limits, but that's the other side of it. And to me, that is the big concern is the institutional knowledge. Legislators do get better over time. And a lot of them, um, but it takes time. It well, it does. And your first session, it's like drinking from the fire hose. It really is because mm -hmm. there's a lot to have to learn. There's a pretty steep learning curve involved. And so I think the first term is kind of figuring out the process, and then by the mm -hmm. second term, you're a little bit better. And if you're already you know halfway to being term limited, limited at that point, it right, right. can minimize your effectiveness. But I've seen members who got in ten years ago who took a fairly bombastic approach but who stayed in the building and got better and realized the virtues of bipartisanship and re reaching across the aisle and just becoming more efficient and effective at what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's 
there's that aspect of it as well. Because mm -hmm. when I think about, uh, you know, you got the metropolitan area here, like in the Portland metropolitan area and Multnomah County aspect of it, a lot of the issues uh, uh, come up because of the population and this, that, and the other. But outside of that, when you think about rural areas and this, that, and the other, they they don't have that population, if you will. They don't have that. So a lot of times, those issues from the more populated area tend to get to be more discussed and at the table. Fair? Oh, absolutely. And th that's one of the minimum wage proposals mm -hmm. is Senate Bill fifteen thirty two, which uh, has kind of the, the tiered minimum wage approach. And then there's a uh, See, this is my handwritten notes yeah. here. Okay, okay, no problem. That's, that's what it's all about. So they have you know two proposals. One's a House bill, one's a Senate bill mm -hmm. that it rises the, raises the minimum wage in increments to thirteen fifty by twenty nineteen. And then you have the other kind of the regional minimum wage approach. But I have a friend who's the mayor down in Coquille. Mm -hmm. He says, Where, "Where's Coquille? Yeah, well, it's yeah. over on the Southern <laughs> Oregon coast." Right. And he said that people are talking to him, approaching him, saying. Wait a minute. So I'm working this job. How is it that somebody working the same exact job in the city makes more? Uh, so I think you're getting a little bit of pushback on right, that. Right, right. Uh, and that's another one of those issues. I mean, affordable housing is getting to be a really big issue here mm -hmm. in the Portland metro right. area, and I'm sympathetic to that. I, you know, I paid my rent today, and I just about have a heart attack every time I do because <laughs> my apartment complex just sold for $95 million. Rents keep Gee. going up. Uh, but the folks in rural Oregon, it's not as much of an issue. Right. I mean, Bend is increasingly metropolitan, and they're having that same issue. And so the proposals that you see to deal with that legislatively look completely different from mm -hmm. legislators in the Portland area than, than from other areas. Uh, one of the approaches that we're taking, this is from Senate Republican Leader Ted Ferrielli, mm -hmm. is a Senate Bill 1548, and it would expedite expansion of the urban growth boundary for needed housing mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the issue around housing affordability has to do with the availability of land yeah, right, and right, the fact right, right. that we've had these land use laws yes. in place for and that's major stuff decades. A lot of time, sure. yes. and it has a completely different effect in rural Oregon mm -hmm. I mean that came up even in some of my small groups at the conference right. yesterday where the guys from the rural part say housing isn't unaffordable where, where we are he says right but your county is just about bankrupt because it was never allowed to develop a tax base because it's against the law to conduct industry or commerce and most of the land there Jesus. so land use has different things for different parts of the state and i think people from washington county viewed it as a way that they preserved their agriculture mm -hmm. and, and, and you know there were definitely intentions behind it but i think there is a growing recognition that if you make it illegal to build a house on most of the land, that the cost of the land is going to go up. There's yeah, no way around right, it. Right, 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 uh, right, right. You can ignore reality, but it's still reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I think that that's kind of where we're at with that right now. But the, I, but the representation from that area is going to basically represent that part, right? Their issues. And you've got this representation over here that's got their piece aspect of it. So who's in the middle? The, the, the lobbyists are sitting there trying to figure out, depending upon who's paying the lobbyists, right? <laughs> I mean, that's basically right, fair. Is that a fair? Well, yeah. So what the, do we do? The, How do we solve this? We, we need a, I don't know, well, we got a governor, we got, uh, you know, so what, what do we do? Well, part of it on the Republican side has just been messaging, just bad messaging um, mm -hmm. and reinforcing the stereotypes that the Democrats have about them. Uh, they didn't do a whole lot of party registration over the last decade, and they probably should have. Mm -hmm. uh, but now we're, we have automatic voter registration, so that changes things up somewhat. Um, but it's all about engaging. It's about having good candidates. In fact, uh, the House Republicans did manage to recruit some good candidates in, in some key districts. From what I've been told, they're going to have more of that. So there's mm -hmm. going to be some more announcements coming. And some of it too in Oregon over the last several years has been kind of the Bush backlash. And that's mm. as long as I'd been involved in that, uh, starting in 2004, where Bush and his policies became increasingly unpopular. Every Republican got uh, associated with that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it became very difficult for Republicans to win elections in Oregon. But mm -hmm. there's also the fact that the Republican Party in Oregon has been fighting among itself yeah. for yeah. the last decade mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so those have all been very big issues, but party unity, I, I think they're getting there. Okay. And you no, know, one of the things I wanted to bring up was that over the fall, 
the Oregon Republican Party did a statewide government accountability and transparency listening tour mm -hmm. as a response to the Kitzhaber scandals and right. the failure to pass a lot of key ethics reform legislation in the 2015 session. And so we went over the state and I, I took part in the stops that were in Oregon City, Springfield, and in Aloha, over mm -hmm. there in Washington County. And what we did was we heard what people had to say and based on that, we put together a package of bills that are going to be up for consideration in okay. the next few weeks. So okay. that's one of the things we'll be working on, is some ethics reform legislation. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that comes to mind, and I'm going to throw this out there because it's been in the press and the news for that matter, the whole issue with um, uh, Honey County, uh, the, 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 the BLM and, and then the political part of that. And then we're right in the midst, if you will, of a presidential campaign aspect of it. And um, uh, what I saw was two issues. You know, the BLM, which is something that, i.e., folks in the city don't have no idea. Well, I remember, you see, I grew up in we, Southern California, yeah, and then uh, we got a place outside of Grants Pass yeah. when we first moved there when I was about 14, and yeah. we had BLM land in the back. And one of our management. neighbors called me that. Yeah, okay. and I, what's what, what, BLM? Yeah. I had no idea what BLM was. <laughs> right, yeah, I grew right. up in and Southern it's impact California. On us, yeah. It's BLM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, it, it's unfortunate the way that situation ended. And I think it's still going on. Yeah, they still have a few is, holdouts yeah. over there. It's brought attention to it. I mean, it. This was all prompted by one particular case mm -hmm. involving the Hammond family. And my boss, Senator Witsit, you know, he, he knows the Hammonds and mm -hmm. considers them friends. And, right. uh, they, they go back a ways. Mm -hmm. And then you have that particular case and the federal prosecution. And some people feel it was almost a double jeopardy yeah. thing, but uh, U.S. U.S. Attorney Amanda Marshall uh, from here in Portland took that case back to the feds, and that's why these guys got resentenced. I mean, they had already done their time and gotten political, out. And then they political. Get, well, and she ended up having to step down because she was apparently you know, trying to have an inappropriate relationship with a subordinate, and she was one of the people that was supposed to be investigating Kitsopper. So all of a sudden you have a situation where you have somebody who needs to investigate the investigators. Yes. <laughs> this is kind of where we're at right now Jeez. in this state. Um, but, you know, I'm sympathetic. I think it would have been better. That it, what looked bad was that most of the occupiers were from out of state. Right. And exactly. if you look, when they arrested, they said they had guys from Utah and Nevada and Arizona, literally all over the place. And they were out there welcome fairly quickly. And they had some town hall meetings. And the people, the locals said, go home. Yeah, we don't yeah, want yeah, you yeah, here yeah, anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I think they used... Because if you remember, a lot of folks came to town to support the Hammonds on their right, way right, you know, right, to turn right, themselves right. into yeah, the federal gun right authorities. Issue. That was that was on the t on the table too. The gun right issues. That's because everybody's out there. You know what I'm saying, right? But but my point is that it got political, and it's unfortunately. And the other thing that I was interested in is that our representation from the standpoint and said, well, this is government issues. That well, it, it is a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and our government representatives are those individuals that are elected to Congress, if you will. And I would have thought that those guys would have, those people would have gotten together, right? Got me? And say, hey, we got two issues here. We got the BLM aspect of it, and that's a set-aside piece. And then we got this other piece aspect of it. You know, uh, we got that. But that didn't happen. Why? One of the things that has troubled me about all of this is seeing the comments that folks make on Facebook where mm -hmm. they're trying to compare and contrast and say that it's completely different, saying, well, you've got... Black Lives Matter, yeah, you've got yeah. these incidents over yeah. here, and then you've got this. It, I mean, it, it, people are trying to separate themselves yeah. deliberately okay. based on ideology, and I think that there's sometimes they're the same issues. Yeah. That it's still the commonality is law enforcement yeah. shooting mm -hmm. civilians. Yes, right. And who doesn't get shot and who does get shot? I was disturbed by a lot of the comments I saw where. Some of the folks on the left, when this thing first started, said, we'll just go in and kill them all. Yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. really? <laughs> because then what if yeah. you're protesting yeah. and all of a yeah. sudden, yeah. I mean, yeah. do you really want people saying yeah. that, too? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you're setting a dangerous precedence. And that's where the use of the phrase domestic terrorist when it yeah. came to this particular occupation got thrown around quite a bit. You know, do you remember the Bush years and... All of a sudden, you have terrorists, and okay, well, you can we we can use drones to attack terrorists. We can spy on terrorists, but then it depends on 
who's a terrorist at the time and what that definition is. And, and so, who has the drone? <laughs> and, and before you know it, you suddenly become concerned. You say, yeah, yeah, you go get those terrorists. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. all of a sudden you go to a protest or something and then you're labeled a terrorist and say, uh-oh, well, does that mean the drones are coming after me? Well, yeah, if you don't watch yourself. <laughs> but but you were fine with it as yeah, long as they were exactly. going after someone else. Exactly, right, so, exactly. But then they changed oh, the definition exactly, and exactly. all of a sudden you fell exactly. under that definition exactly. and the same exactly. policies that you were encouraging exactly. are now being used against you. Well, it's, to a certain degree, it's good that, that I'm not saying that it, it, it happened, but the fact that it's on the table and we should discuss this issue. It should not happen again. But all of the things, as you're saying, all of the things that we, uh, we need to discuss need to be discussed because it's affecting us all. Well, it, it, Big time. The federal government does own a lot of the land in Oregon, and especially yeah. the rural parts, and over half of it. And I covered those issues for years down in Grants Pass, and a lot of these counties don't have much of a tax base because yeah. you have, you know, the federal government owns a lot of the land, and then you've got the state's land use laws on top of that. And between all of that, you don't have much to work with in terms of developing a tax base. Well, like I said, representation. Again, you know, government, you know, our elected officials, they are representative, if you will. They're supposed to be aware of that. We got issues. But hey, buddy, that's why it's going to be good to have you on. <laughs> to come back and we can have these kind of discussions, you know, openly. And we want to thank you very much for yeah, I'll just for be working 60 us. hours a week for the I, next I month that, and a half. But, you know, beyond that, I'll have well, a we're going to give you, we're going to give you some time off for a minute. We, I guess we're going to have, <laughs> um, we're going to have the, uh, the, the football. That we're, we're gonna have Super football, Bowl? Super Bowl. We're going to, and I'm telling you, we're going to give you a time off. We're going to give you a time off. And we're going to give everybody else time off. And my next day off you from everything's thing. two okay, weeks good. from now. <laughs> it's going to be a sprint. But hopefully you'll come back after the, the special session. And you'll just kind of give us a little update. Yeah. Uh, and the folks are really interested in that 15 bucks an hour. The business community is definitely. And that's the people who are not making any money, can't afford it. That kind of deal. So please come back and share with us about the whole piece. There's some other things I want to talk to you about, but sure, we no. can't do it at this point I'll in time. I'll happily wrap up with it. But that. we want to thank you very much, okay? <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate that very much. And folks, again, like I said, you know, get out and register to vote. Don't do it at the last minute. That's a very, very important piece. Uh, when you get your voters pamphlet, like I said, look at it, study it, talk to the neighbors and whatever, and hopefully you can look at the show. We're going to try to share, share with you as much as possible uh, the, the, some of the things that we're doing. We're going to be doing a candidates fair on the 20th of, uh, of February, the 20th of February here locally, here on Oregon Voters Digest, and I think it'll be enjoyable. But I'll, I'll bring you up to date on the rest of this stuff, okay? But again, thank you very much for being with us. Enjoy yourself. Take it easy. Don't stress out on those Facebooks and this, that, and the other, because it's getting crazy out there. We're uh, not as far apart as we want to think we are. Very much so. Okay? Hey, look, have a good evening. I'll see you. Take care. I'll see you a couple weeks from now. Take care. Bye.